Hey guys, this is a brief video on parallel circuit analysis, an extension of what we did in class today. In class today, remember, we looked at a circuit where every circuit element came one right after the other, so there wasn't really an option for the current. Everywhere in that circuit, the current had to be exactly the same, like a conga line connected to itself. In this case here, if we trace, we can kind of see each little sort of element is set up parallel to the others, where all the other ones in the series circuit were in one big loop. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to trace the current, and I'm going to see what happens. So I'm going to start with, with uh, conventional current, start at the battery, and I'm going to trace it around. And now I hit this spot right here, the spot that we're going to call a node, also known as a junction. And that spot right there will give us an option. We can either continue on, or we can turn and pass through this R1, this resistor. Now we reach another junction. But this one, there isn't really a choice. Should I go to the right or to the left? Well, I can't go to the right because that would be moving to a place of higher potential, and that's not spontaneous. That's moving against the field lines, and that would require um, some outside work to help me do that. So I'm just going to go all the way back here to zero. Let's try if we had gone the other way. If we had gone this way, we would have reached another junction. And we could either have kept going on, or we could have turned down. So I'm going to trace this blue line all the way around, because it's a possibility, right, that it started all the way there. It hits another junction. Once again, there isn't a choice, so it has to go back. Crap, it hits another junction, but it also can't go up the R1 because then it would also be going to a place of higher potential, which is not spontaneous. So it has to keep going, and it would end back here at zero. So you can probably tell now there's one more, right? I could have started from the beginning, not gone down the first path, not gone down the second path, and I could have continued and gone down the R3 path and then continued once again, you can't go up the R2, can't go up the R1 because you'd be going against the electric field or to a place of higher potential, and I would have returned all the way. So when I look at this kind of circuit, I see that it's substantially different in a way to the, the series circuit that we made in class because there are three different loops of current. They're not all the same current. Now, which regions do share the same current? Take a second and, and try to decide for yourself. Good, hopefully you picked this little segment here before the first node, and this segment here after the last node, the last junction. You can see that those currents are the same because they are made up of all three branches, the gold, the blue, and the red. So that means that those currents are all combined, whereas in any other place, you either have just one or two of the currents combined. In either way, you can look at this as three kind of independent circuits, because if electrons chose this path, they couldn't also go through R2. Now let's think about why that is. What principle says that if they go down the R1 path, they can't go towards R2 and R3 at the same time? Very good. That's called conservation of charge. And if you think about it, similar to conservation of matter, but that it's that you can't be in two places at the same time, right? So this conservation of charge is telling us that if we go one way, we can't go the other. Now let's talk about a few other things that we sort of mentioned briefly in class. If I removed the R1 light bulb right here, use a different color. If I removed this light bulb, would the other two be affected? Well, it depends what the current is, right? So we look at this picture, and the colors maybe help you, and you see that removing R1 is only interrupting the yellow current. So it's not going to affect R2 or R3, because R2 is on the blue current, R3 is on the red current, but it will affect this total over here with the Xs, because all of a sudden we'll have that gold current gone. So it will change the amount of current. Right? You can see that very visually. Now let's say I back up here 
and I decide to eliminate R2. So I'm going to take R2 out. And the same thing happens, right? Only the blue current is eliminated. The gold current and the red currents are still there, so R1 and R3 would stay lit. And the region where the purple X's are that I'm retracing here, those would also change because you'd have lost the blue current. Anytime there's a gap in a certain loop of current, that whole current is lost, right? Because the electrons have no idea where the zero is then. Remember, they have to be connected from the high to the low potential. And if all of a sudden there's a gap, they don't even move at all because they don't know where, the, where to go. You probably can think of it the same, is that um, the very last bowl being removed, R3, as I kind of backspace here, if R3 was removed, only the red current would be eliminated, but R1 and R2 would stay lit. So this is kind of a cool version of a circuit. It's very cleverly set up, because basically what happens here is that if one bulb goes out, I don't lose the others at the same time. Now, you can tell they may be affected slightly because the total currents changed where the purple X's are, but they're not going to have they're not going to go out. So this would be like Christmas lights if you've had those like sort of Christmas lights that have you can if you look closely at them they have like two, three, four strands, right? So that if a few that one bulb goes out, it only knocks a few out. It doesn't knock them all out, um, which means you don't have to replace the whole thing until you lose more. So you could see here that the the total current would be the um, addition of the gold, the blue, or the yellow, the blue, and the red, all three together. So the total current here is going to be equal to the gold current, which we'll call I1, because it's going through R1, plus the blue current, which is we're going to call I2, because it's going through resistor 2, plus the red current, which is I3, because it's going through resistor 3. They should all add up to the mixed current, which is the purple. Now, let's see this. If I were to eliminate, if I were to cut the wire right here, which of, if any, which of those resistors would go out? Very good. Hopefully you noticed, if you took a minute to think about that, that I've cut all three colors there by interrupting that portion. Hence, R1, R2, R3, none of them would lie. Where's another place that would do the same thing, that would eliminate all three? Very good. Hopefully you notice it would be down here. So that's very good. Now, this is very important right here, this thing that I'm circling in green, because this allows us to see it's a statement of conservation of charge and conservation of matter, and it says that electrons or charge that pass into one branch can also pass into the branch at the same time, right, those specific charges. But once, you know, later on, perhaps they can, you know. Now, we're simplifying the idea of the circuit here, thinking of electrons traveling through the entire thing, but it is a little bit different. Now, which one are they going to choose? Are they going to all be equal, I1, I2, and I3, or are they going to separate um, in some way? So kind of think about that for a second. Hopefully, if you pause the video and thought about that, you would think, okay, the one with the most resistance, according to the Ohm's Law studies that we did, the one with the most resistance is going to have the least amount of current. Um, so R3 would have, the, the red one would have the least current, R1 would have the next least current, and R2 would have the most current, um, most current because it has the least resistance. Now some people get tripped up by that, they're like, why would the electrons choose to go through one or the other, why don't they all go through the, 40, the 45 ohm resistor then, because it's the least current. Well, they're also resistant to each other. So if everybody goes in the R2 branch, then it's not going to be good, right? You're going to have a lot more internal friction, and they just naturally won't go there, right? They're naturally repelled from each other. And so that's what you have to think about. They're not choosing. They're not little people. They're naturally going to move based on the electrostatic attraction and repulsion in this case. Now, a little example that you can think about is pretend there's, you're at the grocery store, 
there's three checkout lanes, R1, R2, R3. Now, don't stretch the analogy further than it needs to go. Let's think of all the people that go through the store, right? You get to the checkout, and you and the rest of Dallas at this Walmart that only has three counters open, and you can choose. There's the young, efficient, you know, college kid who's just working an extra job, and they go really fast through the groceries, scanning them, packing them. There's the little old lady who's really sweet, but she talks really long. She takes a long time to figure everything out. She's R. She, let's make her R3. Um, and then R1, let's make, um, you know, kind of middle-aged guy, does his work, isn't that fast, but isn't slow either. So when you, when you look at those options, right, you gonna, you're going to decide, am I going to go to the really quick lady, R2, She's like the super fast college kid, really smart, does everything efficiently. Or am I going to go to the little old lady who's going to take a long time um, and I, it would take me longer to get through the circuit um, or to get out the store or I, or I you know, sort of hit the middle and go to the guy who takes you know, an even amount of time? Well, it depends, right? Um, the lady who is really efficient is going to check the most people out. So that's how you can think of it. The electrons, most of them are going to go through R2, or most of the charge is going to go through R2, because that's the fastest or the least resistive. The least of them are going to go to the old lady, not because they chose to, but just because she would take too long to, to pass people through. And then R1 would fall in between. So you can kind of think of it in that way, is that you would go to whichever next one's open, but the next one to open is almost always going to be the most efficient one or the least resistive one. So that's kind of how I look at that. Um, let's talk about the voltage really quick, the voltage drops over each one. Let me get to a nice cleaner slide. So here's the same circuit again, and let's, um, let's consider what would happen in terms of the voltage. So if I pass through this path that we talked about before, how much voltage would I have to drop? How much energy would I drop over R1? Good. Hopefully you said 9 volts. And it's true because once you pass through that resistor, you have to have zero voltage again because you've moved to a place of the lowest potential. If I continue on and I go through the R2 one, I can't go back up through R1. So I return here and you can see I dropped all 9 volts over R2. And then subsequently where I had the red before, same thing would happen. I drop all 9 volts through R3. Now, technically, the length of the wires, so red would have the most amount of wires to pass through, that would also take up some of your voltage. But we're going to say that all our wires have negligible resistance. So the cool thing about the, the parallel circuits is that it drops all total voltage over each of the branches right? It drops all total voltage. So the total voltage of the circuit, in this case 9, is just equal to the voltage at voltage drop, I should say, over an R1, the voltage drop over R2, and the voltage drop over R3. We'll pick up on the resistance in class tomorrow.